Welcome to the Louisiana Sports Download, where we bring you exclusive interviews with sports figures from around the Pelican State, as well as in-depth content surrounding current events at the high school, collegiate, and professional levels. Please welcome your host, Hunter Bauer. Hey everyone, welcome back for another episode of the Louisiana Sports Download. We are, uh, we're glad you have joined us, and for those listening to our show for the first time, remember to check us out every Friday with new episodes available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you enjoy your podcast listening. Uh, today we are excited for this episode. We have a very special guest joining us. Uh, I'd like to welcome the head coach of the LSU Fighting Tiger baseball team, Coach Paul Maneri, and uh, he's a American baseball Coaches Association Hall of Famer, four-time National Coach of the Year, two-time SEC Coach of the Year, and 2009 National Champion. Coach, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you, Hunter? Oh, doing well, doing well. Thank you for uh, coming on the show today. Happy to be with you. All right, Coach. Yeah, so let, let's get started. Uh, you know, we just wanted to kind of dig into your career. Uh, you've been at a a couple of elite programs and then have uh, winded up at LSU. We just wanted to uh, talk to you about that. But first, tell us about your earliest sports memory. What was it like to grow up uh, the son of a of a Hall of Fame baseball coach? And um, did you ever think you'd follow uh, in his footsteps one day? Well, thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, I did have the great fortune of being the son of, of Demi Maneri, who, when he retired from coaching, was generally regarded as the greatest junior college baseball coach in history. He was the first junior college coach to reach a thousand career victories and he won a national championship and had five second or third place finishes. Plus he had about 30 of his former players make it to the major league. So as you might imagine, I grew up in a pretty uh, intense baseball environment <laughs> watching my father uh, work with those players. And uh, I just always enjoyed sports and, and enjoyed being an athlete and being around my dad and his team. And so I was one of those unusual young men, I think, in the sense that at 14, 15 years old, I knew what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And I wanted to do what my dad was doing. I wanted to be a college baseball coach and hopefully impact some young people's lives and be around sports. And, you know, for me, I've been very lucky in my coaching career, Hunter. I've, I've worked at four wonderful institutions, of course, capping it off at the best of all at LSU. Um, but I've just been fortunate every step along the way uh, for a lot of reasons, you know, mainly because I had an awful lot of great young men that, that I had an opportunity to coach. We've had some success. And it's been a, it's really been a, a ball for 37 years, going on 38 years now. That's awesome. So, so coach, you you started your uh, your playing career at LSU in 1976. Tell us about the that year and uh, how how uh, what led you to uh, to come into Baton Rouge the first time around. Well, growing up as Demi Maneri's son and watching the Miami Dade North Community College Falcons every day. All, all I really wanted to do was play for my dad someday. And uh, what happened is back in those days, Hunter, it's, uh, recruiting for college baseball is not near, was not nearly like it is today. Now, you know, it's national recruiting. You have showcases all over the place. You've got uh, assistant coaches that are out on the road all the time. Back in, back in 1975, when I graduated from high school, it wasn't like that at all. You know, basically a phone call from a high school coach or a junior college coach to a to a Division One school, and and you got you know if they needed a particular position, they were you know they offered just scholarship. It just so happened that in my junior year, LSU made a trip down to Miami, Florida, which is the city where I grew up and where my dad coached, and they were going to play a series against the University of Miami on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But on Thursday night, they played a game against my dad's team. For my dad's team, it was a big deal. For the LSU, it was an exhibition game, so to speak. And um, I met the coach, and you know, I've, I was a huge Pete Maravich fan growing up when I was in high school. And those, those purple and gold colors, they just kind of grabbed me, you know. So when the coach um, called next year and offered me a scholarship to come to LSU, I, I just thought I should take it and um, – 
you know, my dad was on a teacher's coaches, you know, you know, salary and they weren't making a lot of money at four siblings. And I thought I should take this opportunity to come to LSU. And I loved my time at LSU. I only stayed one year as a player because my heartstrings were really just tugging on me and I wanted to go back and play for my father. And if I didn't go for my sophomore year, then I would have lost that opportunity forever with it being a junior college. So I reluctantly left LSU, went back home, played for my dad. And then, of course, you know, my eligibility is up. I need another place to go. And just by the grace of God, I ended up back in Louisiana. And I played at the University of New Orleans under a tremendous coach, Ron Maestri, and uh, had a wonderful experience there. So I spent three of my four college years here in the state and uh, got an opportunity to still play for my dad. So, uh, you know, you grew up around some pretty influential uh, uh, baseball coaches. You know, you mentioned your dad and Ron Maestri, and even, you know, you've had a relationship with Tommy Lasorda. What were uh, what were some of the lessons you, you've learned through those years and even today, and how do you apply that, you know, as, as a coach yourself? Well, I, again, like I told you, very fortunate. I, I had an unbelievable mentor growing up. Not only was my dad a great father, uh, but he, he knew I wanted to go into that profession. And mm-hmm. so he taught me everything really along the way and about how to handle players, about how to put a roster together, you know, game strategy, just, just, you know, so much of what the way I do things now is the way my father taught me. But I also wanted to learn from other coaches because, you know, your dad is your dad, but, uh, you know, you just like to try to spread your wings and, and get somebody else to mentor you and, Mm -hmm. and, and learn from other people. And I really feel like it was just a a blessing that I was able to play for Ron Maestri at the university of New Orleans. And at that time, Mace was really building the program at UNO and he was a hustler, man. He he (laughs) did whatever it took to to get the job done. And, and I, I watched it the way he did it. And I learned so much from him, you know, that no job was below you. Sometimes he dragged the field or water the field before games and then go exchange a lineup with the, with the umpires and the other coach. I watched him go out in the community in New Orleans and get people to support the program. And I realized how important that was because, you know, b- baseball budgets were not very big. And if you needed something for your program, you had to find somebody that cared enough about your program that they would give you some financial help. And then I was very fortunate after I started coaching, I was 25 years old coaching a small school in Miami and I got to meet Tommy Lasorda, who was the, at that time, the most popular manager in major league baseball at the Los Angeles Dodgers. And I don't know why Tommy took a liking to me, but you know, I listened to him and and we developed a relationship that has lasted all these years, almost 40 years now. Uh, even to this day, and Tommy's nine, now 92 years old, and obviously he's slowing down a little bit, but I just was with him this past summer, and, you know, I just love him to death, and he taught me so much about, you know, bringing joy to the field and being positive and, and you know, loving your players and, you know, those kinds of things. And so I think my coaching style is kind of a mishmash of all three of those men that really influenced me, plus adding in my own personality. Yeah, it's uh, that. I was going to say that's a, a very um, that's a very good trio to learn from. If if I if I can say that, um, that it doesn't get much better than that, in my opinion. Um, mm. So yeah, so you said you know you go to UNO uh, under Ma- Coach Maestri, and um, you know you, you uh, help the team win two Sun Belt Conference titles, and y'all even go to the uh, the 1979 uh, Division One baseball tournament. And uh, talk a little bit about that. That because you said that uh, you said it yourself that Coach Maestri, you know, he came there to build that program. You know what, you know, what did that mean to the program, uh, to the university, the city of New Orleans? Because I mean, Coach Maestri, he's he's pretty much a legend there. Well, you know, um, everybody knows about LSU nowadays, and of course, Skip put LSU on the baseball map with right. five national championships and so forth. But before Skip came to Baton Rouge. Mace was really kind of the big moving force for college baseball in the state of Louisiana. In fact, he he took the very first Louisiana team to the World Series in 1984, the Division I World Series. He had taken a 
when UNO was Division Two, he had taken them to the World Series in, um, I think, 1978 or 77, excuse me. Um, so Mace really knew how to build a program. And it, I, I was so fortunate that we had a lot of teammates of mine. I was fortunate that a lot of teammates of mine were kind of that, you know, overlooked uh, player that uh, kind of played with a chip on his shoulder. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we had a lot to prove, you know, and and I'll tell you what, Mace put together a couple, the two years I was there, a couple of pretty good teams. I always kid everybody. I always kid Mace, I should say, and I tell everybody that Ron Maestri put me in the NCAA record book for the most consecutive games batting ninth in the order. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to brag with people and tell everybody that I was the worst player on a really good team, which is much better than being the best player on a really bad team. So we had the two years I spent at UNO were really great. I had tremendous teammates. Randy Bush was my roommate, played 11 years in the major leagues. Mike Claudia, who went on to manage in the major leagues, was another teammate. You know, we just had so many good players. that Actually, after my senior year, every single player in our starting lineup plus three pitchers were drafted. So we had a very talented team. And to be be honest with you, to this day, we're very disappointed we didn't make it to Omaha. We lost to the regional in, uh, at Mississippi State. And you got to, um, I, I believe you got to coach against Coach Mastry when he came back to New Orleans uh, in, uh, later in his career. Is that right? Oh, you know, Mace took about 25 years off. That's right. He, he retired and was, became the athletic director mm-hmm. and, and then did other things. And then two years back, they, they brought him back to be the coach again. And uh, his very first game back, the first two games back, were played against LSU. Ah. So <laughs> I, I, did, I don't really like competing against Mace. You know, but he's, I love him like a father. And, and he's, you know, he had such a great influence on me. And I always root for, for my friends like that. And I, I didn't really enjoy playing against him, but it was a unique experience. Yeah, he really is a great guy, and uh, I got to talk to him a little bit when I was uh, a an, a sports information director at McNeese, and uh, he was yeah, he was such a good guy. Um, so, you know, doing a little research, uh, I noticed you played uh, a summer ball in the Cape Cod Baseball League, and you were named an All Star. Uh, what was that experience like, and who were uh, you know? Did you play with any uh, any big names uh, during that time? Well, the experience of playing in Cape Cod in the summer was something that I'll always cherish. Even to, all the way to today, it's generally regarded as the best collegiate baseball summer league. Right. And all, only really good players get to go there. So it was a great opportunity for me to, to play there that, that summer. I did make the all-star team, which was a great honor, and uh, very proud of that. But really, it was just the, the experience of playing against so many great players, Um you know, those players that played in those days, you, you wouldn't recognize those names. You're too young to remember those guys. But played against a lot of future major leaguers. And, uh, you know, on our own team, I played with Randy Bush, who became my roommate at the University of New Orleans the next year. And like I said, Randy spent 11 years in the major league. So that whole experience was, was all part of what, what allows you to have fun playing the game in college and it hopefully had a great influence on me, you know, as I started into a coaching career. Um, so you, you, uh, finish up your playing career, um, and you start going into coaching. Did you go straight into coaching or was there a, a little lapse between then? Cause you said you, you, um, had an assistant job, I think at a high school to start your career. Well, what happened, uh, Hunter, was after I, my senior year at UNO, I got drafted by the Chicago White Sox. Oh, okay. And and uh, played a, a short season in the New York Penn League, and and then my, my I had met a girl at LSU who uh, later became my wife, and we decided after I finished at UNO that we would move down to Miami, get married in December, and uh, and she, you know, was great. She always has been a great support of mine, you know, whatever I've wanted to do with my career. And she was just, she thought it was an adventure to move to Miami. And so we did that. So I was helping out a, a guy by the name of Jim Hendry, who later became the general manager of the Chicago Cubs. Oh, wow. And Jim and Jim was an assistant coach on our team in, in the New York 
excuse me, in the Cape Cod League, mm -hmm. and we became fast friends, and still to this day, are he's probably my best friend in the world, and vice versa. So, um, what happened was he became the high school baseball coach at my alma mater, and I was his assistant for three years after I got released from professional baseball. Uh, I, you know, I didn't progress very far in pro ball. And so when I got released, I, I gave coaching my, my full-time attention and I was his assistant coach for three years. And then when he moved on to become a college coach, I thought that I would be promoted to the head coaching job. Mm -hmm. However, however, my alma mater, um, bypassed me and they, and they decided to hire somebody else. And so, you know, I had a, I had a, ambition to become a head coach so i kind of started to search elsewhere and there's a there was a small school in miami a division two school called st thomas university and they had a position open and, and i was able to convince them to hire me so that was where my coaching career started and i learned a very important lesson at that time too you know i was very discouraged and, and disappointed when my old high school didn't hire me and they had kind of slammed the door in my face. But I learned that when one door closes, another door opens. And if you spend all your time learning about the door that closes, you don't find those open doors. And that, that became a lesson that I learned in life and a lesson that I share with my players a lot as well. Yeah, you're right. It's um, it's amazing how when one door closes, uh, you know, by the grace of God, something better is going to come along uh, eventually. Um, so, yeah, tell us a little bit more about St. Thomas. You know, you, you spent, uh, I think, six seasons there. You became the winningest coach uh, there. And uh, just talk about how that helped, um, you know, that place really helped, you know, jumpstart your career and and uh, gave you a, gave you a chance to uh, get some head coaching experience. Well, after I was named the coach there, Hunter, I realized why the job was open. Mm -hmm. uh, not many people but would have wanted that job. I think oh, wow. we had two scholarships. We didn't have a very nice field. Oh, they had gosh. never had a coach that stayed there longer than two years in a row. Really? And oh, so they had, they had not had much success. I don't even know if they'd ever had a winning season oh, before. Oh, my gosh. But, uh, but I loved it, you know, because it, it gave me a chance to fulfill my dream of becoming a coach. We had no help. We didn't have any full-time staff members. And so I had to do everything myself. And, and that was great. You know, you, when you have to do, do everything, when you have to rub up the balls and drag the field and cut the grass and, and do everything else, it gives you a greater appreciation later on in life when you have people to do those things that you, you understand how hard they work for the program and it gave me a great appreciation for the fact that everybody contributes in a, in a way that helps your program be successful. But I was so excited to be a coach. I was just a young guy, 25 to 30 years old during my six years there. And, uh, we, you know, we started to have some success and, and I think people recognize that and I'm very proud of it. And now today, St. Thomas University is no longer NCAA Division II, but they are NAIA. But in two, two times in the last five years, they've played in the national championship oh, game wow. in NAIA. And, and I had a great honor when they, they actually named the field after me down there in Miami at, at uh, St. Thomas University. So it's a school that, that I feel very proud of. I, I'm very appreciative of them having given me my first chance took a chance on me and you know it, it paid off and and you know we were able to establish a good solid program and it opened up my next door which was the united states air force academy yeah i was actually going to ask you that i i did not know this but when i was researching um you became the first civilian to be the head baseball coach there at air force what <laughs> Coach, talk, talk about how what led to that, and was it challenging? Was were people against it? Or were they for it? What what made that happen? Well, the the amazing thing, and again, it's amazing how fate can work. But mm -hmm. what turned out to be my last year at St. Thomas University, we played the United States Air Force Academy, and we had a good game, and we beat them. And after the game, the coach asked me if I had applied for the job at Air Force. I, I looked at him kind of funny, and I said, I don't understand. You mean your job? And he explained to me that he was a, an officer in the Air Force, and he was on a temporary jo uh, job instead of, you know, 
um, doing what he normally does for the Air Force. They made him the baseball coach for three years at the academy. But they wanted to get serious about having a good program and wanted to hire a civilian where they thought they could have some continuity and, and hire somebody that understood what coaching was. And I was really fortunate that they ended up naming me the coach. And what a great honor that was. For six years, I had the opportunity to coach wonderful young men, uh, many of who went on to, well, all of them actually went on to serve our country in the active duty in the Air Force. But I'm so proud of the fact that I probably am the only college baseball coach in the country. I could say this actually with a great deal of confidence that has as former players two individuals that are generals in our armed forces. Oh, wow. So, two generals. I think that last count, I have about 25 former players that are full colonels. So you don't, the Air Force Academy kids don't get a chance to go on and play professional baseball, but they make their mark in our society by being leaders and the custodians of our way of life. And so I took my job very seriously there, not only just being a baseball coach, but in, in believing that I was trying to help them to know how to be successful when they're in that cockpit and they're in a dog fight, you know, winning is the only option there is. And I hope that somehow I helped influence them on not necessarily how to fly a plane or fly in combat, but having the characteristics and qualities that are necessary to be successful. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what uh, what were the challenges in, in recruiting for Air Force? Because, you know, they, they, they go on to have a career uh, within the military. Is there is there a difference recruiting uh, from a regular university against, you know, versus a, a, a school like Air Force? Well, yeah, it, it's about as different as anything could be. Mm-hmm. And the reason is because, you know, when you're talking to a young man that's 16, 17 years old, about joining the Air Force Academy, and then once he graduates, going on to serve serve his country, you know, that's a hard sell because, you know, all young kids have a a dream of playing Major League Baseball someday. And uh, you have to kind of convince them that, you know, you're a good player, but you probably don't possess what it takes to make to the Major Leagues. You could get a free education at Air Force, uh, one of the best educations there is. And then, you have a guaranteed job when you graduate. Uh, you can retire at 42 years old after 20 years in the Air Force and still ha- and still do something else if you want to. You still have plenty of time to do that, God willing. So, you know, I, you know, we were able to recruit some kids, but, you know, when you look at the talent level at Air Force compared to, you know, an LSU or Florida or Texas, you know, it doesn't compare, but, you know, they, the kids at the Air Force Academy are on a much more important mission than winning a national championship. They're right. preparing themselves to go into combat and help keep our country free. So I understood that, and I understood that, you know, we might be limited on how far we could go with the team. And, and that didn't discourage me at all because I just felt that it was a calling to help those kids become, you know, very successful adults. And, you know, we used to say we were in the business of developing warriors and winners at the Air Force Academy. And uh, I loved my time there. And I thought I'd be there for the rest of my career. But, you know, one day I got a phone call from the athletic director at Notre Dame. And that was a hard one to turn down. So you get your chance to you know, you really turn around your third program, the third program you're at, you help turn them around. I mean, uh, you know, y'all were contenders uh, every year. Y'all went in the Big East tournament, uh, record five straight seasons. Y'all go to the NCAA tournament, it seems like year in, year out, and even go to the College World Series in 2002. Talk about how, um, you know, turning around a, a program like Notre Dame and, uh, you know, what were the challenges behind that as well? Well, Hunter, the, you know, the um, when I went to Notre Dame, they actually were achieving some pretty good success. Mm-hmm. But they, play, they played in a very poor conference, mm-hmm. and then we moved into the Big East Conference gotcha. while I was there. So we had to get better. And, um, you know, I, I, I tell you what, I was very proud of what we did at Notre Dame. It was very hard to compete with schools in warm weather climates. We were located in north, northern Indiana. Right. And, couldn't play a home game until April. And so that was the biggest challenge that you faced there was that, 
you know, you were, you were going to have to compete with teams around the country, even though you couldn't get outside until the first day of the, the, the season and have to be on the road mm-hmm. every year. Um, but somehow we found a way to do it. We had, again, great kids. I think I had about nine or 10 kids during my tenure at Notre Dame that eventually went on to play in the major league. So we had talent, you know, we had players that were really good and, and, uh, you know, they, they all came together in 2002 and we were able to make it to the World Series. It was the first time Notre Dame had been there in 45 years. Oh, and wow. that was something we were really, really proud of. And and just like I love St. Thomas and I love the Air Force, I also love being at Notre Dame. And I, again, I thought I'd be there for the rest of my life. Um, they, you know, I had opportunities to go to some other schools, even in the SEC mm-hmm. and the Big 12 and so forth. But, you know, nothing appealed enough to me to, to want to leave Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. And so that day I got a phone call from Skip Bertman when he was the athletic director at LSU. And I decided to take a leap of faith and come back to where my college career started at LSU. And hopefully it'll finish here at LSU. Coach, how did those three jobs, how did they prepare you for a uh, for a job such as LSU? Well, you know, it, it's funny you ask that question because I was just telling somebody the other day, I, I don't feel like I could have done the job at the Air Force Academy unless I had the six years under my belt at St. Thomas. And I don't feel like I could have been a good coach at Notre Dame if I hadn't had the experiences of both St. Thomas and the Air Force Academy. And I can tell you with a very clear conscience, there's no way we could have had success at LSU if I hadn't had all those years of experience at Notre Dame as well. And you know, LSU is a very unique place in the sense that people care about baseball so much here. You know, the, the pressure on the coach to, to provide a good team is unlike anywhere else in the country. But it's something that I, I'm not afraid of, or I embrace it because, you know, you, I finally got to a place where everybody cared about baseball. You know, my, the first 25 years of my career at those three other schools, I spent so much time just trying to convince people that college baseball mattered and we had great kids and they were worth supporting and coming out and see play and so forth. Well, when I came to LSU, of course, Skip had already done all of that back when, in, during his tenure. So it was my job now just to be handed the keys to a, to a very successful program and, and to keep it going and keep the history and tradition going. There was a little bit of a lull there between Skip and, and my tenure. And, you know, we, when, when we got here, you know, the first year was a little bit tough, but our second year we went to Omaha. Third year we won the national championship. And even though we haven't won a national championship in the last 10 years, I still feel that our team has been right up there in the upper echelon, you know, in college baseball, we've been a national seed, uh, I guess about nine times in my 13 years. So we've had, we've had some of my best, some of my best teams didn't win in Omaha. And, you know, you, you realize and appreciate the 09 team because they were able to win that last game of the year. And I've had other teams that probably were just as talented, if not more talented, but they just, you know, they came up a little bit short of the ultimate goal. And we realized just how hard it really is, but hopefully the the next championship will be right around the corner for us. I hear you coach. Talk about, um, talk about that 2009 season. I mean, it was magical. I remember I was a, a senior in high school and me and my dad, we were, we were sitting on the couch watching that last game against Texas, uh, you know, that last strikeout. And it was just, it was awesome. What coach, what was going through your mind, uh, on that last, on that last strikeout pitch? <laughs> yeah. That, relief. <laughs> that, 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 yeah. A little bit of relief. Sure. Um, great exhilaration. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, when Lewis Coleman delivered that pitch and mm-hmm. the, the Texas batter swung at it and, and the ball was past his bat, but not yet in the glove. It was like that moment was frozen in my memory. And, um, you know, I realized how fortunate I was, you know, to not only have coached a team that won the national championship, but just to have the opportunities that I've had and to meet the people that I've met in my life. And, and on a, from a personal basis, you know, to, to achieve, you know, the, the pinnacle of your, of your career that day in Omaha and to, 
to be lucky enough to have had both my parents there, to have, have my brothers and sisters all there, to have my best friends there, to have my wife and my four children there, all there to share that moment with me was something that I'll never, ever forget. And uh, even though, you know, the next time we won a championship, you know, my, obviously my dad is, won't be there because he passed in March. And, you know, my kids are now grown and they've got their lives. They may not all be able to congregate in Omaha. You know, it'll, it'll be special to win another one because, uh, you know, the first one was so much fun. And I thought we'd have two or three more by now, but we've just come up a little bit short. That, that, that next one will be really sweet when we're able to get that last out. What, uh, your relationship with Skip, what, how has, how has that been? What advice has he offered you, um, over the years that you've been there, especially before that championship game, did he offer any sort of secrets or uh, just kind of let you do your thing? <laughs> well, let me tell you, Skip's great, and my relationship with him is so great. Um, we just had lunch together yesterday and talked for a couple of hours, and, you know, he's retired now, and he's in his 80s, and, you know, he said to me yesterday that he just loves to sit and talk with me about baseball, and I just have so much respect for him. He, you know, he's a dear friend. He's like a second father to me as well. And, uh, you know, when he called about, you know, 14 years ago, when he called to want me to come down and talk to him about the job, if, if it wasn't Skip Bertman, I'm not sure I would have taken the job, to be honest with you. It's, it's the fact that Skip was the athletic director, cast a big shadow over the baseball program. And a lot of people thought I should have been afraid of that. And I told him, man, that that's, I'm not afraid of it. That's why I want to do it. You know, you, when you have somebody like Skip right there to kind of mentor you and give you counsel and help you when you need some, some things, you know, I told Skip when I came here and decided to take the job that I, I'm not going to establish any goals for championships or anything like that. I just want to make you proud of me. And I, and I hope he is, you know, I hope we've continued the, the legacy of the program to, to to be a you know a program of excellence, I, I know, you know, I, LSU fans are disappointed we haven't won more national championships, just as I am. But you know, it, it's hard because there's just so many good teams out there now, and uh, that's the way, that's a good thing for college baseball. It means baseball's healthy, but just it makes it hard to have a dynasty. You know, you you just all you can hope for is to put together a good enough team that you can be in the battle for it every year. And coach, you know, honestly, I'm looking through the the um, the results from every year right right now, and man, you know, it, it's something that LSU fans, I think, sometimes um, they lose sight of. But I mean, I'm looking through here: College World Series champion, NCAA regional, Super Regional, World Series regional, World Series Super Regional. Coach, there's there's teams out there that would kill to to just go to one. Uh, super regional, um, you know, and, and LSU competes in the toughest uh, conference in baseball and all the sports. And, you know, just talk about, man, it, it's, it's, and y'all have been a national seed, you know, nine times, like you said, just talk about how special that is and, you know, how, you know, really a lot of teams would just kill to have a resume like that. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate you saying that. And, you know, we're at LSU, and I know LSU fans are used to a, a standard that's mm-hmm. different than everywhere else. And, and I can and I appreciate that, and I understand that. But you can't go to Omaha without every step along the way. Right. And, you, and when you get to Omaha, it's not automatic you're going to win there because there's seven other great teams that you got to beat out for the championship. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody... You know, so many people think that, you know, the next season begins where the last season left off. Right. You know, last year, we unfortunately lost in the Super Regional to Florida State. And now everybody's like, okay, well, we can just, you know, make it one more step. But it, every year is an entity into its own, and you get you got to start all over again. You know, we lost Josh Smith. We lost Antoine Duplantis. We lost Zach Watson. We lost Zach Hess and Todd Peterson and, and others. And, and so there's, there's voids on our team that we have to fill now just to be competitive enough to put ourselves in a position to get back to a super regional and get, have ourselves a chance to get to Omaha. So if, if all you do is focus on the ending of the season and then you say, 
okay, it was a successful year or not based on the fact of whether or not you won your last game of the season in Omaha or not. Well, most of the time you're going to be disappointed. And that's why you, that's why you have to enjoy the journey along the way. And as I'll, as I'll tell our players when we congregate again next week when school starts, that we're not even guaranteed being in the SEC tournament. We have to earn our way into that. Right. And then we have to then we have to earn our way into a regional and we have to earn our way into ability to host a regional or host a super regional. And if we're fortunate enough to win all those weekends and get to Omaha, then you're staring seven other great teams right in the face. Right. So it, it's it's a challenge every step along the way. And if you if you look too far ahead it just seems so daunting, you know. You just got to enjoy every challenge, every day uh, along the way. And, and hopefully it builds up the team's confidence, builds up the record to a point where we can be selected to be a host again. And then it comes down to how well do you play on a given week and at the end of the season. And if you play well enough to avoid losing two games, you keep advancing. And that's what we're going to try to do again this year, just like we do every year. And I believe it's going to happen, Coach. Um, so I always told myself, if I ever got a chance to talk to Coach Maneri, I'd have to ask him this question. So I'm going to ask you. <laughs> May 8th, okay. 2016, yeah, I think it was a home series against Arkansas. Y'all are playing, and all of a sudden, a possum comes on the field. <laughs> and the legend of the rally possum well. was born <laughs> coach talk about that and just it's amazing how things <laughs> especially with social media these days just blow up talk about how that not really i guess affected the team but i guess maybe it really did rally the team it, it was their magic there <laughs> well you know we were losing that game nine to one at that time we were not playing well at all and then the next thing you know we get a break here. Their short stuff threw a ball away. I remember a um, you know, little base hit here, base hit there. We ended up tying the game in the ninth inning and then went into extra innings. And, and uh, Jake Fraley scored from third base when their first baseman uh, tried to throw behind him and back pick him at third base, and the ball got away. And, and we pulled this one out of the hat. You know, it was a game that clearly looked like we were going to get beat. And next thing you know, we're winning it. You know, our fans are just the greatest. You know, they, anything anything that they feel could have given us some help, <laughs> you know, divine intervention, whatever, you know, they, they, they just love to, you know, talk about it. And uh, I think it's I think it's wonderful, you know. Um, if they think that that possum really helped us win that game and, and get us on a hot streak, then I'm all for it, you know. But obviously it takes a lot of great players to right. play well at the right time for all those things to happen. And, uh, you know, I don't know what will be the, our rally call this year <laughs> in 2020, but whatever our fans think it should be, then that, I'm all for it. I hear you, Coach. You know, you talk about how, uh, you know, really the players, they, they make the difference in the game. Uh, my next question was, you know, talk about <clears throat> at LSU, how rewarding has it been, you know, to coach players like Alex Bregman, uh, Lewis Coleman, Rafe Rhymes, Aaron Nola? You know, what what did they teach you, Coach? <laughs> well, let me tell you this. Um, LSU has magic in its name when it comes to the sport of baseball. And we attract, you know, some really good kids. Uh, kids like Ray Frimes grew up in the state of Louisiana, and it was always their, his lifetime dream to play at LSU. All he needed was an opportunity, and when he got his opportunity, all he did was go out and lead the nation in hitting. Other kids, other kids like Alex Bregman, he's from Albuquerque, New Mexico, because of the history of LSU baseball, he was attracted to it. But obviously, we had to out recruit a lot of good schools to get Alex to come to school. And then, you know, whether or not he even comes to school is going to be a question because he's going to have a tough decision to make coming out of high school whether or not to go into professional baseball or not. And so many of our recruits have that tough decision. And we, we lose on an average every year, Hunter, about three kids that decide instead of coming to LSU, they're going to start their professional career. And that, that, that can that that can get frustrating for us at times, you know, because you you anticipate this player helping you in a big way, and next thing you know, he he's not a part of your program because he decided to sign, and and 
you know, I respect that every young man gets to make that decision because they're talented, but it, but it also leaves a void and you have to overcome it. But the, but what I've chosen to do through the years is just, you know, emphasize the ones that do come to school. And, and we've had plenty of great ones. Look, look at Aaron Nola. He could have signed at a high school and he didn't, he came to school and currently on our team right now, we have all kinds of kids, Jaden Hill, AJ Labus, Landon Marceau, Daniel Cabrera, all these kids could have signed professionally coming out of high school, but they decided to come to LSU because they wanted to have the experience that they have here. And they, and they also felt that it could help them develop into a, into a pro player that when he enters into pro ball, that they'll be successful. It has been the greatest thrill of my life to be able to coach young men like this. Every day, I, I don't have a tough time getting out of bed at all because I go out to the field and I get rejuvenated every day by the, all that youthful enthusiasm and energy. And, and, I, and it's exciting for me to see how each of these players are going to develop and collectively how they're going to help our team develop. And I believe every year is going to be our year, and I hope that... 2020 is going to be our year. Yes, sir. Um, you know, I know you've had a lot of a lot of players make it to the big leagues, but but coach, I believe you know at least the last three or four years, uh, Alex Bregman has just been on fire. Um, he's he's mm-hmm. a he's a big name over in Houston. You know, winning a World Series and and going to the World Series this year, coach. Was it? Is it almost like an out of body experience? Going, oh my gosh! You know, I coached this kid, and and now look what he's doing, and, and the success he's having. Well, he he's a special player, of course, and and not only is he a special player, he's a special person. I, I've never coached a player that loved the game of baseball more than Alex Bregman. Yeah, uh, he couldn't get enough of it when he was at LSU. If it, you know, we're we're sitting here. At, Six thirty, seven o'clock, whatever. Talking on the phone, doing an interview. I guarantee, if Alex Bregman was in Baton Rouge, he'd be in the batting cages right now, or he, or he'd have talked to managers and to turn on the lights so he could go take some ground balls on the field. Uh, he just, you know, he he. There was no way Alex Bregman could fail at the game of baseball because he worked so hard at it. It meant so much to him, and uh, he he was just phenomenal. We you know we won 156 games in the three years that Alex Bregman played for us. That's really? an average of wow. 52 a year, and uh, you know we won SEC championships and we went to Omaha twice during his time, but we came up short of winning the national championship, and that'll forever gnaw at me that we had a great player like that here. And we didn't win the national championship while he was here. And we were good enough to do that. One year, his freshman year, we went to Omaha with a record of 57-9. and nine. And it, unfortunately, we had some bad luck out there and just couldn't get the job done. And, you know, we weren't able to come home with the big trophy. But I still don't think that diminishes the experience that Alex had here or, from that matter, the experience I had of coaching Alex. I love him to death. I think he's he's the greatest, and I'm so proud of everything he's doing, just like I am all the other guys. I mean, you could right. talk about the career Aaron Nola has mm-hmm. had, or how yes, about sir. DJ LeMayu, the, the job he did for the New York Yankees That's this right. year. Yeah, you know, this year Ryan Eves and Jake Fraley got called up to the big leagues. I think that was my 17th and 18th player that I coached here at LSU that has gotten to the big leagues already. So I'm real proud of all those guys that that get to the big leagues, the dedication, commitment, the hard work that they've put in. And I hope that LSU had a little bit to do with them getting to where they are now. Oh, no doubt. No doubt, Coach. Um, Yeah, Transitioning a little bit, you know, during your tenure, you've um, you've made it a point to play other uh, in states uh, uh, D one schools, um, especially at their home venues. Um, Coach, how important is that for collegiate baseball in Louisiana? And talk about and give a little reasoning why uh, you like to do that. Well, you know, when I came to to um, LSU. And Skip talked to me one day about scheduling philosophy mm-hmm. and 
And I've always admired Skip, not just because he won five national championships, but he always did what was best for the game of college baseball. And he told me, you know, that when he would take the LSU team to different cities in the state of Louisiana, that it was always a real big deal for those communities. And it helped that coach of that opposing school, you know, help promote baseball in their area. So it's something that I've tried to keep that going, you know, like Skip did it at one time, it would be easy for us to just sit back and play every game at the box. But, you know, we went to Lake Charles and played at McNeese a couple of years ago. We'll be going back again in a couple of years. Uh, we, we've gone to Natchitoches. We've gone to, you know, uh, Thibodeau to play Nickel State or Hammond to play Southeastern Illinois. Southeastern Louisiana. I don't know why that slipped out, but you know we've gone to all these different cities, and they always have the biggest crowd that they've ever had whenever we show up, and it and it's exciting for our players to see that it might only be three or four thousand people, and our players are used to playing in front of ten or twelve thousand at the box, but because the stadiums are not built to to hold that many people the the crowds are overflowing they're very enthusiastic and and you can you can see how much the uh, the other team and other teams coach really appreciate that we came there to play and and you know and sometimes we lose those games sometimes we win them sometimes we lose them but what, whether we won or lost it, it's good for college baseball in the state of Louisiana and I think uh, you know, it's it's my obligation to do those kinds of things. I wish I could go more frequently, but because we have so many schools in the state and we're limited on how many games we can play, I have to kind of rotate around where we're going to go each and every year. You know, one of those um, rivalry games that I feel like is is a is a big, um, really a big deal for for LSU fans and and LSU players is the. Um, you know the Louisiana Lafayette meetings, and you know this year it's going to be a little different uh, since we lost Coach Robichaux. Um, Coach, just talk a little bit about his legacy and uh, your relationship with him, and and um, you know we we lost a really good guy. Yeah, well, it is really different. I'm afraid it's going to be very emotional for me personally. Um, not that I have anything against their new coach, but you know Tony was. Tony was such a good guy, a class guy, and we had a great relationship. Um, you know, we we reinstated the series that they hadn't played LSU and UL for a couple of years. And when I came on board, I reached out and said, "Come on, Tony, let's play. Let's. It's good for baseball. It's good for the kids. It's good for our communities. And and we should we should re- restart this series. So we did, and we never had an ounce of issues between the schools. You know they it was always great sportsmanship. There was always great competition. Uh, and, and I always enjoyed my time visiting with Tony before the games, talking about his family or my family. And, uh, I'm going to miss him. You know, he, he obviously did a phenomenal job there. Um, not just in wins and losses, but just in the way that they have, you know, their kids, how they have matured and developed as players and people and, you know, Tony's legacy will carry on forever because of the players that he coached and the and his family and so forth. And uh, you know, it's sad to me that he that he was taken from us way too young. But I'm I'm really appreciative of the fact that I got to know Tony, that I got to coach against him, that we worked together to promote college baseball, and uh, you know, I'm just gonna miss him an awful lot. Yeah, we are too. He, um, yeah, like you said, he he's done a lot for for baseball in Louisiana, and uh, yeah, it's 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 really not going to be the same without him. Um, well, coach, before we let you go, uh, I got to get a prediction out of you for Monday night. Um, how do you think the uh, <laughs> national championship game is going to turn out? <laughs> well, we all know how it's going to turn out. Those Tigers, the Tigers are going to win. <laughs> there you go. Both teams are named the Tigers, of course. Well, <laughs> I, I just think. You know, LSU has something really working special this year. I, I was sitting in a hotel room watching that game against Oklahoma, and it, it was ha- it just turned halftime, and I, I just kind of shook my head and said, this is so surreal watching this. Did, did that kid really just throw seven touchdown passes <laughs> in the first half? Did he really just throw for 400 yards in the first half? <laughs> 
I'll tell you, it's, 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 they've got a lot of great players on LSU's team, and Ed has done an amazing job bringing it all together. Uh, I just think that we have a team of destiny this year, that it's our year and nothing's going to stop us. So I'm going to go out on a limb and predict that LSU, the LSU Tigers are going to whip Clemson. I, I do that. think Clemson has a really good team. I, I, I thought they would beat Ohio State by more than they did, in mm-hmm. fact. Um, you know, uh, 29 in a row, they've got the great quarterback, great defense. I mean, it's not going to be easy, that's for sure. But I just think LSU is going to find a way to win. It's They're playing in our backyard. Uh, I just think, like I said, LSU is a team of destiny this year, and hopefully they'll finish the job on Monday night. I believe that too, Coach. And, uh, you know, I honestly think that success is going to uh, translate uh, into good things for you and your team. And I really believe you are going to have a, a good year this year. And, and uh, you are, I believe we're going to be seeing you all back in Omaha again this year. Well, I hope you're right. And uh, I, I happen to agree with you on all those points as well. <laughs> <laughs> all right coach well we really appreciate you coming on and uh, taking the time to talk with us and uh, we look forward to uh having you back as a guest in the future okay it's my pleasure thanks for listening be sure to follow at louisiana preps on twitter facebook instagram and youtube And don't forget to subscribe for free to listen every week to the Louisiana Sports Download.